Martha, Lazarus, and Mary were all disciples of Jesus. People who loved and followed Jesus, opened their home to him, shared their table with Jesus in fellowship, and enjoyed Jesus' friendship, as well as lived by Jesus' teaching. Each had their own unique relationship with the Lord, yet together, as a family, they displayed all the aspects of a church. Especially the sisters Martha and Mary teach you and me about blessing God as a whole body of believers. In studying the Bible, learning the doctrines of the Christian faith, that does not make a person wise or strong in their faith. In fact, wisdom is not about knowing. Wisdom is about using what you know. In spiritual terms, the wise person is the one who lives out the truths they know, not necessarily the Bible scholar and the theologian. This came home to me in a really particular way when I was reading Alan Hirsch's seminal book, Re Jesus. Among the many wise things in this book is the concept of balance between three areas of faith. Orthodoxy, which we're probably the most familiar with, that's right principles and right thinking guided by scripture. Orthopathy, which we're probably the least familiar with, is right passion, right feelings, the love and joy the Bible talks about. And then orthopraxy is right practice, doing good works. Alan Hirsch pointed out that when these three elements become imbalanced, we notice. The imbalance of orthopathy, for example, overemphasizes spiritual experiences. It's, it's this emotion-filled worship and prayer time and, that make faith and relationship with God feel like it's fading when those experiences are missing. It's an imbalance. Then an imbalance of uh, orthopathy downplays the importance of right thinking or Bible study and the importance of right doing, the work of service and of obedience to God. They may put a high value on love and joy and of spiritual ecstasy, but it doesn't translate into a mature, lived out faith when it's imbalanced. But you know, the scales can tip in other directions too. An imbalance of orthopraxy, for example, creates that burned out do-gooder who has used up all their energy in doing good deeds and serving other people and sacrificing everything, but without that sense of connection or orthopathy, which is very important when it's in balance to God's love and grace and power, but also without applying scriptural wisdom, which is to say knowledge to priorities and opportunities. So orthodoxy is important. But an imbalance of orthodoxy can drift into legalistic rules and law-oriented faith, valuing doctrine over mystery and justice over mercy and law over love and being right over being gracious. Judgmentalism begins to edge out orthopathy and orthopraxy when there's this imbalance, and then we forget Jesus' table was open to everyone in fellowship. So balance is very important between these three elements of faith. And we might say Martha brought in the importance of right doing in her service to the Lord and in right thinking as Jesus developed her faith in knowing the truth about his divinity. And now enter Mary, who said few words, but whose passion and practice made a deep and lasting impact on Jesus' heart and our understanding of discipleship. And we see her first sitting at the feet of Jesus then we see her kneeling at his feet, and finally, we see her anointing his feet. So let's begin with Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. There is strong evidence in Luke's gospel that many women followed Jesus as his disciples, traveling with him, evangelizing and supporting Jesus' ministry out of their own, not only means, which is to say their own financial means, but also their own means, which is to say their own gifts and their own abilities. And they functioned in many ways uh, the way disciples traditionally served. It seems Mary also took her place among these disciples, recognizing Jesus as her rabbi. It took great courage for these women, several of them like Mary who were single, to step outside the boundaries of their culture and their religious mores to align themselves with Jesus' movement. They had pioneering spirits, but even more so, they were passionately devoted to God and therefore to Jesus. And it seems Martha and Mary were also Jesus' disciples, but they did not seem to be of one mind in how they were to minister to Jesus. 
Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him, Jesus, and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Jesus loved Martha, and he empathized with her. Her orthopraxy was taxing. Opening her home to him and to all his followers, especially when they came unexpectedly, certainly did require the many things that were distracting her. But Jesus did not agree with Martha's thinking. The Lord answered to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Now I wonder how Mary felt in that moment. She had stepped outside of the role her culture mandated, and her religion told her was the only right way in God's eyes. But she'd been listening to Jesus' teaching, and Jesus was changing how she understood the scriptures and God's wisdom. Her devotion to Jesus and to Jesus' teaching had moved her to take this position as his disciple. There really was need of only one thing, and that was to love and be with Jesus. Martha's expression of love came in gifts of food and in acts of service, but Mary's expression of love was in giving her time and her touch, sitting at Jesus' feet, receiving his teaching. And then the next time that we see Mary, she is again at Jesus' feet. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. When John wrote this gospel, the story of a woman anointing Jesus' feet had already become well known, circulating around, and John now alerted his readers it was Mary of Bethany. Knowing that would help John's audience understand Mary's and Jesus' very deep connection, as well as Mary's spirituality and her keen sensitivity. They were a well-to-do family, owning their own home, and evidently they even had a private family tomb. And the Lord had eaten many meals at their house, and he had spent many nights there too, and it seems as though Bethany was kind of a sanctuary for Jesus and his disciples. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. The message the sister sent did not ask Jesus to come, but certainly the request was implied, knowing that Jesus loved Lazarus. Yet by the time Mary and Martha's servants had reached Jesus with the news of her brother's illness, Lazarus was probably already dead. Jesus immediately recognized this was an opportunity for God's glory, so he gave the messengers a reply to take back. This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It was the same thing Jesus had said about the man born blind when his disciples had asked Jesus who sinned. Had the man sinned? Is that why he's blind? Or had his parents sinned? Neither, Jesus had replied. This situation is an opportunity for God to be glorified. Imagine the sisters' tears when they received Jesus' message. By now, they'd already placed their beloved brother in his tomb. And Jesus' words must have seemed strange and hard to understand. This illness won't end in death? Because Lazarus was dead. Maybe they thought Jesus was comforting them with the thought that Lazarus was going to be with God. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, you, you see here, John made a point of saying that Jesus loved Mary, and he loved Martha, and he loved Lazarus. That's the reason he stayed two more days. Doesn't that seem odd? Isn't that an odd way to show love? After all, they knew that all Jesus had to do was say the word long distance, and Lazarus would have been healed. If nothing else, wouldn't love have sent Jesus back immediately to comfort them? and to help them through this very difficult time? But he didn't. Because he loved them, he stayed away another two days before he and his disciples made their way to Bethany. And when Jesus arrived, Mary had already seen him coming, and so she ran out to him, and the conversation they had brought out revelation Jesus had never before given. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. 
It must have been electrifying to hear those words. Filled with wonder and excitement, Martha went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, maybe hoping Mary would have the same intimate moment alone with Jesus that Martha had just had, a profound moment that would change everything. The teacher, and they called Jesus rabbi because they were his disciples, is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, when Mary heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And that was probably to allow for that private moment to happen. But the Judeans who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. So they followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. The mourners thought she was going back to the tomb because it was the custom to go to the tomb as often as possible during these first days of mourning. And it does say something about Mary, that all the mourners, these were important people, people down from Jerusalem. These were the Jerusalem elite and the wealthy people from Jerusalem. And there were scribes and Pharisees and all kinds of really important people. All these mourners were gathered around her. Whereas Martha was alone and could move in and out of the house and even in and out of the village, apparently, without much notice. Mary was attractive, maybe beautiful, but certainly, at least in her character and in her person, she was compelling. And without realizing it, without trying, Mary led this whole company of Jewish religious leaders and Jerusalem elite to Jesus. And then overcome with both love and devotion to Jesus, her teacher, yet also abject grief over her brother and Jesus' beloved friend, she fell at Jesus' feet, saying the same thing Martha had said earlier, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Her humbled place at his feet portrayed her trusting humility. It was a statement of faith as well as an expression of hurt. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Judeans who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. The spiritual and emotional connection Mary had with Jesus went deep. Jesus was moved to the depths of his own being, so much so his face streamed with tears. And there was Jesus, tears streaming down his face as he followed Mary to the tomb. Greatly disturbed and distressed, Jesus was moved by his love for this family and for their pain, and perhaps troubled over his own part in their suffering, just as later he would wrestle in grief and great pain over the necessary suffering he would endure for the sake of the infinitely greater glory of his own resurrection and redemption of sin on behalf of the world. And when the Lord saw Mary's broken heart, he responded by crying with her, empathizing deeply with her pain. Throughout the Bible, God does this. God is outraged over the damage that sin and corruption and death do to God's people. And God feels deeply all the heartache you and I go through. And so we imagine them together, Jesus sharing his tears with Mary, who shared her tears with him. There are really only two places where Jesus was this vulnerable, this moved, this connected with someone that he shared his tears with them. Here with Mary of Bethany, and then a week later in the Garden of Gethsemane, pouring his own heart out in prayer to the Father. So the Judeans said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Were they wondering at the extent of Jesus' power or Jesus' love and care? It's possible they had already been asking these questions, and that's why Mary and Martha had both said to Jesus, if only you'd been here. Imagine Martha and Mary now, walking on either side of their rabbi and Lord, as they made their way to the family crypt. The third day had come and gone, and now the stone had been placed over the door. Lazarus was truly dead and gone, beyond even the faint hope of resuscitation. Now think of their gasps when the stone was taken away and their brother was returned to them alive. 
Many of the Judeans, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. And now we come to the story John referred to earlier when he was describing the raising of Lazarus. John was identifying who Mary was for his readers, because they already knew about the anointing of Jesus from the three other Gospels, which were already circulating. But they may not have known who the woman was. Now John was setting the record straight, along with adding in some more details. Jesus had been keeping a low profile in Ephraim, some distance away from Jerusalem, for about a month or so after Lazarus' resurrection. Now, as the Feast of Passover was approaching, Jesus came back to Bethany to stay until Passover, just six days away. The way John writes it, it sounds like this dinner was given in honor of Jesus by all the locals, maybe all those who'd been there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. We know that Simon the leper, probably someone Jesus had healed, was the host. Martha was serving the meal, and besides Jesus and his disciples, there were other guests, including Lazarus. Like, it sounds like a big party, actually. Everyone was taking a chance, since there was an arrest warrant at this point out on Jesus. And at some point during the evening, Mary brought out an alabaster jar containing a pound of pure nard which would have been worth nearly $56,000 in today's terms. Nard was an aromatic oil that came from the resin of a plant that at that time grew only in India, and it was something she had apparently been saving for a while. The other Gospels note that Mary first poured the perfume on Jesus' head, which is reminiscent of when prophets would anoint kings of old. Now, the word both Gospels used that describe this is not the same word used for anointing, but Mary's action must have looked similar. And John added that Mary also anointed Jesus' feet. In the next chapter, Jesus would wash his disciples' feet in an echo of what she did for him. As the oil poured out, she loosened her hair and wiped up the excess so that all the perfume would be on Jesus and none would drop to the floor. Months earlier, another woman had done the same thing for Jesus, crying as she wiped Jesus' feet at another function in a Pharisee's house. A woman's hair was considered her glory and was to be enjoyed by no other man than her husband. It was unthinkable to loosen her hair in an open setting. Yet Mary openly expressed her affection and her adoration for Jesus in a way that would have made everyone uncomfortable in that room. Symbolically, she linked herself with Jesus, having given to him her worldly treasure, her womanly glory, and her prospects for the future. In that moment, Mary publicly joined her life with Jesus. Everyone in the house was affected by Mary's gift as they breathed in the rich scent of this expensive perfume. And since she had the perfume now in her hair, wherever she went, she would also be reminded of the Lord. In contrast to Mary's giving spirit was the action of Judas, a man driven by greed. Judas was not impressed with this scene or the aroma filling the house. All he could think of was the enormous amount of money that had been lost. Money he could have skimmed off for a handsome sum for, for himself. Judas' growing resentment, his disrespect for Jesus, and his greed all came bubbling up. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. But it sounds so pious, doesn't it? It's amazing how easy it can be to think up a good reason or good reasons to cover what are often selfish and self-centered motives. The other disciples admired Judas. They had no idea that he was stealing from them or that he'd been preparing to betray Jesus. Until the very end, they thought Judas was a devoted follower of the Lord. So now in the moment, the other Gospels recorded that all the disciples echoed Judas' sharp rebuke of Mary. But Jesus wouldn't have it. Mary had not spoken a word. Yet having taken on a prophetic role, she had shown Jesus she had been listening to him 
and that she understood what was about to happen. Her sensitive spirit knew what would speak deep into Jesus' heart and soul, and to prepare him for what lay ahead. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. He loved Mary's gift, and he felt loved by her gift. She had given him a costly sacrifice before all, a beautiful gesture of love. Jesus also noted that what she had done was prophetic. God had intended this for Jesus. He had been telling them that he was going to die soon. He had laid before them every detail. There would be lashing, there would be the cross, three days in the tomb, and then his resurrection. Mary got it. Mary got Jesus. There are very few occasions in Scripture when Jesus felt truly seen, truly heard, truly understood, and known. This was one of those rare times. And Mary did what she could to honor Jesus and to show him she understood. Costly devotion is precious to Jesus. Mary showed her deep love and respect for her rabbi and her Lord ministering to Jesus and also joining her life with Jesus as the excellent example of a devoted disciple, the kind of disciple Jesus had asked for, one who would abide in Jesus. Judas produced a stark contrast as the anti-disciple, seemingly pious, certainly admired and well-respected, yet holding no love nor respect for his Lord. Mary broke many barriers for women in her first century Greco-Roman world. She sat at Jesus' feet with the disciples. She called Jesus her rabbi. She received his teaching as Jesus' disciple. In this final story with Martha again providing the setting, Mary acted both prophetically and powerfully. Her reverent and solemn performance both evoked the kingship of Jesus and at the same time evoked the funeral rite of anointing. Here was orthopraxy, orthopathy, and orthodoxy displayed in perfect and profound balance. Mm -hmm.